Does an amateur radio operator need to know how to use a multimeter? That's the question for today. Hey everyone, I'm Bob, KD4, BMG, HOA Ham. And on the workbench in front of me are three of my favorite multimeters. For those of you who've been around for some period of time in the amateur radio way of life, you're going, duh, of course you need a multimeter. Some of you newer or somewhere in between new to well experienced are going, well, what's a multimeter? And you know what? Every one of those responses is just fine. I'm a bachelor of arts person living and operating in a bachelor of science world. I accept that. I have a mechanically uh, influenced mind. I've worked in construction much of my life. I can build my own home almost from start to finish. I've run a lot of electrical circuits. As a matter of fact, I rebuilt most of the electrical in this home that my wife and I took down to the studs, had it inspected by the local building department and passed with flying colors. So I've figured out over time how to take this Bachelor of Arts mind and apply it to things that I don't necessarily completely understand. And that's one of the cool things about amateur radio. You don't have to know everything to get started, but you know, you should keep learning. So I've owned many multimeters in my life before becoming an amateur radio operator. They all sat in a toolbox out in the garage. And once the batteries finally corroded them away before I ever turned them on for the first time, I replaced it with another multimeter. I owned a multimeter for 30 years of my adult life before I ever learned how to use one. And I didn't start until I picked up amateur radio. So today we're going to learn just some of the basic functions of using multimeters for ham radio. With all the capabilities offered by PCBWay.com, you might not be sure how to get started. I suggest you click on that button in the bottom right-hand corner and take the opportunity to speak to a live customer service agent. Up pops that window, you simply identify yourself, enter the category about which you wanna ask a question, type in your question. How do I submit a project for a custom machined component? And before you know it, that CSR is busy answering your question and providing you with the opportunity to take the next step. Don't forget to give them a thumbs up for their helpful service. Head on over to PCBWay.com to start your next project. I use Kai Wheats almost exclusively for my multimeters. You could choose a number of different brands. We're talking about hobbyist gear here. This isn't going to be used by a NASA engineer or an engineer designing, developing, working at the construction site of a nuclear power plant. They're using gear that's designed for that purpose that is 50X, 100X the cost of these items. This is hobbyist gear. So don't read into that, that this is inaccurate. It's just, this is designed and developed differently because it's hobbyist gear, the criticality is lower. Therefore, it's less expensive to manufacture. For our demonstration purposes today, we're going to pick the KM601. This is perhaps my favorite multimeter just because it is really simplistic to use for those that are just learning and are not quite as knowledgeable of a multimeter, like somebody with an engineering background would navigate towards this over this. Me, I'm not an engineer. This is what we're going to use for our illustrations today and understand we're just going to do the basics, the bare minimum of some things that I use, and maybe this will be a help to you. Why don't you comment below if you do something else in ham radio with a multimeter that I don't cover that you think perhaps would be interesting on another video, or you think HOA ham, this would be a good thing for you to learn and experiment with. We are going to bounce around just a bit. I'm going to show you some real life examples of things that I've done since I've become a ham radio operator and needed to use a multimeter. So we're not going to demonstrate this kit today, but I do recommend this kit if you uh, purchase a multimeter, whether again, it's Kai Wheat or some other brand. This has many other connections that allow you to test items better, i.e. the leads can adapt to different things. I'm just going to use the basic probes and suffer through that today. And I'll do a future video showing how to use a test lead kit and make your life a little bit easier. One of the main reasons that I like the KM601 is once you turn it on, first of all, it starts out in auto mode, and then it also tells you where to put your test leads. So that's a nice feature, especially for newer amateur radio operators. And it's going to do an automatic test of just a small selection of its capability. Now you can manually determine what feature you wanna test in auto mode. It covers a lot of features that most ham radio operators are interested in. So let's just go ahead and get our test leads 
plugged in just like it told us to. And again, those of you that are highly experienced, you know, for you, this all is a second nature. For many people, it's not, especially those just getting into amateur radio. So I'm going to do something today that's really going to be um, perhaps um, out of the box, uh, maybe even for those who have been experienced. I'm going to basically hypothetically talk about a piece of coax run when i ran my ham shack and rebuilt it um, it's the shack that you see in my videos and i ran coax to my attic space that attic space is really right above my head uh, if i went from where i'm sitting in my shack to where some of the coax feed i could probably hit it within 12 feet direct line of sight but the distance that it had to travel through the shack and through the wall, up the side of the house on the outside, through the soffit, back into the attic space, there's runs in there that are over 25, 35 feet long. I marked all of my coax with a zip tie as I was installing it. You've seen me do this before, but a couple of them towards the end as I was getting tired, well, guess what? I ended up with coax in my shack that didn't have a zip tie and coax in the attic that did not have a zip tie. If it was only one, not a problem. We know what to do. We know it's the same coax. I ended up with three. How did I figure out which was which? Sitting in my shack into the attic. Well, what I did was I took a low voltage of DC current and you would want to do this either with someone helping you or you wanna make sure that you're setting up so that nothing can short out. All I'm doing is using just a five, what is this, a five, three amp? Is that what these put out, these USB-A ports? And let's just turn on this basic power pack. I'm going to be running some uh, power down the feed line of this coax the center conductor and touch my ground to ground right that makes sense to all of us and if i take my multimeter i'm going to be able to find that this registers with the multimeter and look at that we're measuring the volts of our dc current at 2.4 so this worked with my 25 foot and 35 foot coax runs from the shack up to the attic. So even though I had three that I couldn't figure out what they were, I came down here into the shack. I made sure that my leads were separated so they couldn't touch and short out. I went up into the attic space and I found which of the three was receiving the power to it. And then I marked it. So we knew what to do from that point on. A few weeks ago, I was out doing an antenna installation and review video, as well as a new tuner that I was reviewing for one of my favorite manufacturers, and I needed to power it with my BioNO battery. Well, actually, I had my FT991A with me, and so this could kill two birds with one stone. One of my cords went to my 991A, and the other went to provide power to the tuner and actually a control box that controls the tuner. I couldn't get the tuner to work. Shame on me, I didn't have a multimeter with me. I eventually found a distribution block and I just took it off of this, finished the installation uh, and set up and then everything worked. And I brought the battery home and I immediately started to test it out thinking what was defective here. And before long, uh, just a matter of moments, checking what my DC, there we go, voltage is, I realized that my BioNO 30 amp hour battery was just fine. It's operating in the voltage range that I would expect. And that's one of the things you can do with a multimeter. You can check your voltage range on all your batteries. Kind of gives you an idea on capacity. There are tables out there that will tell you for a LifePo battery what uh, voltage range tells you how much capacity has been depleted. So what I realized later is I didn't set up that control box correctly for that tuner and that was my failure, not this. Had I had my portable uh, multimeter with me, it would have been no problem. I would have grabbed this out of the truck and would have immediately recognized I do have my power coming in, my power poles are terminated correctly and the problem is somewhere else. So I went and solved the problem in a way that really wasn't the right solution. My point is, um, this is now going to permanently be in the truck. I'll leave a link 
to the video where I actually reviewed this and provided and showed where you could get this little case because the leads will fit in here with that tiny little multimeter. And so it's a, just a great device to have on the go. But our multimeters are great for checking our batteries to get a voltage reading. Also, if we didn't have continuity here, we would find out quickly. We wouldn't get a correct voltage reading. So this is a way that you can check your batteries. Now this video could go on and on. It's not my purpose to be exhaustive, but rather to give you ideas. If you were working on a specific electronics project and you had resistors, diodes, capacitors that you purchased from your favorite electronics component store or Amazon, and you wanted to make sure that they were actually in the range of the tolerance specified by the manufacturer, you could use your multimeter for that. I just didn't want thousands of little parts scattered across the workbench today. I'm gonna to talk about two continuity projects or ways that I use this. One was protecting my radio. One was understanding this antenna system from G Gable Radio. This is the 7350TC. It's the 3 8 by 24 version. This end goes to our feed point for our coax to our radios, and this end receives a WIP antenna, whether it's collapsible uh, or uh, telescoping. So we would fully expect as we adjust our coil, we're changing our resonance on various frequencies, right? So there needs to be continuity from top to bottom. And there is. So this has been out on the market for quite some period of time. When I started uh, talking about this on my channel, it kind of became a popular antenna system with good reason. It's a fantastic antenna system that's highly portable and small and really, um, pretty functional given its size. Well, G Gable Radio, without any input from me or anyone else, went and anodized it. This is a laser etch in the anodize. Well, I'm pretty familiar with anodizing. I work in manufacturing. I'm familiar with the anodizing process. And when I first saw this, I'm like, oh my gosh, uh, we have restricted the transfer of the signal because anodize blocks signal. Well, I don't know what kind of anodizing they're using over there with their manufacturer, but indeed we have continuity. So I don't know what they did, but for me, I saw something that was an improvement. I immediately grabbed the multimeter because I was concerned and the multimeter confirms we have continuity. So again, I test out a lot of antenna systems using my multimeters. Okay, I'm going to reserve the right to change horses midstream. We are going to pull something from this kit because we need it to make it more simplistic to do a test of these leads. So the continuity test is going to preserve my FX for CR. Some of you are aware that I own an XPA 125B 100 watt amplifier. I did multiple reviews on that amplifier and how to use it with the G90, the X5105. Don't own an X6100, but you could use it with that. I've used it with the IC705 and I showed the proper setup for that. Those were some of my earliest YouTube videos. I look back on them now and horror at the quality of the, the video content, etc. But nonetheless, that's a journey for me. So I use this device right here. It's an amplifier keying interface that goes between your radio and the 100 watt amplifier, and it provides an extra level of protection for your radio. So some of uh, the people that watch my channel know that I own that amplifier and they've asked me, Bob, why haven't you done a video with the FX4CR demonstrating it being used with the XPA125B? And I've said to myself, why haven't I? So I went and I grabbed my uh, buffer here and I got ready to set it up. And all of a sudden I realized I had two cables to go between the buffer and the XPA125B, and all of a sudden I thought to myself, oh no, what am I going to do? And in actuality, I think this is the cable that goes to my radio. Yep, so the radio is going to accept this uh, TRS connector here, and then I think one of these called RCA connectors is going to come over here to the buffer. Well, why do I have two of them? I have two of them because I've done this with multiple radios. I've used the XBA125B with multiple radios. Well, well, they look alike. So whoever made these, i.e. Radio Dan, eBay seller, I'll leave a link to his eBay store because these are products that can save the radio that you own and keep you from letting out the smoke. So I thought he just used one color versus another because that's what he had available at that time. It's the same cable. 
Well, I did some measurements with my multimeter and found that not to be the case. So let me take away this pointy probe. How's that for a technical term? And then we're going to put in its place this alligator clip. And that's what I mean by this kit. It has lead connectors that make it easier to do your tests because now we can just take this and put it on this terminal and it's holding firmly in place. And then I'll take my other probe and I'll just go on the three sections of this connector. There are three sections. Each one has its own electrical properties. For those of you who don't understand a TRS connector, see it has wires soldered to different areas that correspond to these three areas on the connector or the pin. So you need to know how this is operating and we need to see if these are both the same before I plug it into my radio and send the smoke out of my radio. We don't wanna do that. So I'm going to go section by section here and see when I get continuity. No continuity on the tip. There's my continuity, it's on the center section. Okay, well, if that holds true for here, then these are exactly the same. So let's try that. Just move this lead over to the secondary cable. Let's see, does it go to the center? <laughs> it does not. It goes to the tip. <laughs> All right, so here a low cost, highly functional multimeter has saved me from letting the smoke out of my $550 radio. I hope I didn't just say out loud what that cost me. That could get me in some trouble. So here's another fantastic use of a basic tool to very simply identify the difference between two cables that virtually look alike. And this just goes to show that even a Bachelor of Arts mind can do Bachelor of Science stuff with the right training and a little bit of encouragement. I'll leave links in the description below to this Kaiweets gear in case it's of use to you. I hope you found this helpful, friends. I'll talk to you soon, 73.